Thank you. 
Say that for cell phone, Vinny. Can you hear me now? Back when you didn't get receptions very good, and sometimes we still don't. I was, uh, I was fortunate to finish the message today. I got a call from TJ's grandmother from Alabama. She, man, she loves to talk. <laughs> and um, not only did she call me once, she called me twice, and both of them were long, long times on the phone. But uh, anyhow, she's a sweet dear lady, and uh, but we had a good time with her today and learned something about TJ. <coughs> that I did not know, so uh, anyway, she was helpful. But anyhow, we are glad to be here tonight. I trust you are as well, and I uh, trust you had a blessed day. And uh, if you did, something's wrong with you. Bless her, all right, because it's gorgeous, gorgeous outside today. And uh, it's just a, a great day to be alive. In fact, I consider every day a great day if my name's not in the obituaries. But uh, I'll be honest with you, I thank God for the day. I'm serious. And the hair was doing better. Praise God. Yes. And <laughs> I love him. My brother is the best ever. My brother is the best hair ever. <laughs> we are in a series entitled Complete in Him. Tonight we begin a new text and a new section of, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 through verse 29. So if you're turning your Bible there, we will read there tonight. And the title we've given the message tonight are you a soldier of the cross? And uh, Paul loved that theme. There are several ways Paul presents soldiers uh, when he gives us the uh, Christian life. In Ephesians chapter 6 and the uh, going to war, warfare. How does he present it? He presents it as being in a battle, as being a soldier of Jesus Christ. He also tells us in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, that we ought to be good soldiers for Jesus Christ. So a soldier is a popular theme of Paul and the Holy Spirit leading him that direction. Possibly he would write about being a soldier uh, simply on the grounds that he was with him quite often. How? When he was bound with him in prison. And uh, so he had a lot of knowledge about soldiers and how they conducted themselves and other such things. So Colossians chapter 1 tonight, beginning in verse 23, Paul writes and says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof Paul am, I, excuse me, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been from hath been hid from ages and from generations, and now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ, how like this, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Are you a good soldier of Jesus Christ? In the city, or just outside the city of London, there is a cemetery known as the Dunhill Field. It is a field that people were buried many years ago, 
And those that are buried in that one distinctive piece of ground were called dissenters in their day. It all happened, of course, in the nation of England. And those that are buried there happen to be dissenters from the Church of England. They're rebellers. They're revolters. They're people that did not agree with neither the doctrine nor the way the Church of England was carried on or was going forward. Today, it is called no man's field or bun heel field. But many people are buried there. Among those that are buried there is a man by the name of William Defoe. Anybody remember William Defoe? And it, you would know him if you knew and knew the book that he wrote. Robinson Crusoe. He's the author of Robinson Crusoe. And uh, John Bunyan is also buried there. And Bunyan was against the Church of England. And anybody know what he wrote? But yeah, when you go to Bible college, you, you learn some of these things because you have to do some of these things. Uh, John Bunyan read a Christian allegory, and that allegory happens to be called Pilgrim's Progress. Now you know, and uh, very good allergy, by the way, an allergy of the Christian faith and the Christian walk. Uh, and then also buried there, oddly enough, is a lady by the name of Susanna Wesley. Now you know who she is. She happens to be the mother of Charles and, uh, good night, can't think of his name, John Wesley. John being the preacher, Charles being the music leader and the music writer. Also buried there, though, is also another famous Christian, one by the name of Isaac Watts, who contributed to the hymn book over 600 hymns in his day and time, of which we would sing today. He's actually called the father of English hymnology. Um, anybody ever study hymnology? I have several thick books on my shelves in my library called Hymnology. And what it does, it gives you excerpts of all the hymns that have been written. Or I won't say all of them, a lot of them are there. And Isaac certainly, or Watts, is uh, there frequently because of the way he wrote certain hymns. There are stories behind hymns. In fact, my wife is good at doing this quite often in prison. Uh, the inmates will be usually say, well, I enjoyed that. I never knew that. But she'll tell some stories on hymnologists people who wrote the hymns, and what led them up to the time to cause them to be inspired, or whatever you may call it, to write the words of many of the hymns of our faith. But Isaac Watts happens to be a tremendous writer. Uh, how many of you know one of the hymns at Calvary? When I survey the wondrous cross, he wrote those, and many, many others. But one you may not know. Uh, happens to be literally written about a soldier. And the title of that hymn actually is literally called um, A Soldier of the Cross. And it was written in a very, very dark time, not only for him, but also for his family. He was also writing, doing some severe, great times of persecution, not in Russia, not in a communist country, but in England. Keep in mind, why was this country founded? Really? Anybody know? Why did they decide to leave England? They came for religious freedom. Because of the Church of England. So it's all about. Though you don't hear that in history anymore. God forbid it be in a history book in a public school system any longer. But it was a very dark day in England when he wrote that song. And the reason behind the song or as we call it, hymnology history, is that he was being persecuted. His family severely persecuted, so much the so, his daddy was rotting in prison for his faith because he refused to bow down and go with the guidelines of the Church of England. You think about that. Can you imagine if something like that occurred in America instantaneously overnight? I wonder how many real Christians would really go all the way. I really how many have. You see, there's a difference in people believing something and having convictions in what they believe. Vast difference. You're looking at one guy that's got some convictions about what I believe, and I won't change for anybody. You understand that? I fight for some of mine, and I'd like to think maybe be willing to die for most of what I believe. Uh, when you get as old as I do, you don't really care about dying anyway. You know, it's just another thing, just another bit of life. 
But uh, can I just simply tell you, we need to be good soldiers in our day, more now than ever. And I think the day's coming in America, and I'm not the only one saying that, by the way. Uh, when uh, I think it's maybe this upcoming sermon this coming Sunday, uh, there are a lot of preachers chiming in, not just preachers, a lot of media now chiming in that the days in America are swiftly, swiftly changing, where particularly as against the church and against Christianity and those of the faith. Uh, have, has anybody followed what our maybe future president, God forbid, she's a she, so that tells you who I'm talking about, said about Christians? Okay? I'm telling you. It's here. It's at the door, folks. We never in the history of America had so much boldness verbally, even by media, vocalized against the church of Jesus Christ in America. You understand that? Anybody understand that? Uh, so there's some, there's some possibilities that we may be and see some of that. Well, the song you wrote, Am I a Soldier of the Cross, the title. Listen to the words. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood in this vile world a friend of grace or a friend to grace? To help me on to God. That's the first stanza. But it's a great hymn because it reminds us that we're in a spiritual warfare. We're in a battle for the faith, for what we believe, for where we stand. And I trust we do stand for something. Uh, someone has well said, if you stand for uh, nothing, you will soon fall for anything. And there's a lot of truth in that. You've got to know what you believe. Paul wrote about being a good soldier in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4. Therefore, notice how he describes it, endure hardness. Anybody's ever been in the military, military life can be a hard life, difficult life, especially in the presence of war, especially on the battlefield. Uh, watching a, um, uh, some clips the other night of war and what our troops... <coughs> went through particularly around holidays, how very, very hard it is for our men in uniform and women in uniform now uh, to uh, carry on doing particular holidays, uh, the, the family missing them, and how vitally is the lifeline of sending them something from home and for them to at least get pictures or back in the old days to get a letter to encourage them to keep fighting on. But so it's endure hardness as a good soldier, Jesus Christ. For no man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What does that mean? It simply means, hey, there's only one person we really ought to care about pleasing in this life more than anybody. And it's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Two of you agree with that. Amen. <laughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, The Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction and sorrow. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Affliction, sorrow, difficulties have a way to sometimes train us, to give us new experiences, and to shine our faith more in the dark than it could ever shine in the sunlight. A great church historian said the blood of martyrs is the seed of the saint and of the church. Can I just simply tell you, a lot of people have died for this book I hold in my hand. I'm going to share a bunch of those with you a little bit later in the message. You'll see a couple of, of films, or not films, but pictures. But a lot of people. That's why this book ought to be dear to us. That's why it ought not to be just something we just do Treat it like dirt. Treat it like it's unimportant to us. It ought to be held closest to our hearts, and it certainly ought to be held by us every day in the reading and the searching of the Scriptures. Why? Because, man, it took the blood of martyrs to give that. Everyone that gave us the King James Bible died for their faith, one way or the other. Every one of them. 
And you really need to read where that book came from and how we got the Word of God. It is not just any religious teaching. It is the living, breathing, literal, every word, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of the living God. And man, I tell you what, the more I study it, the more I just know that it's so, even though you don't have to teach me anymore to prove it, that it's the Word of God. How powerful is the Word of God? Well, instead of too many Christians being soldiers today, being interested in being soldiers, I think well said when I found online a statement someone said, said many Christians in the church today are more interested in frolicking, having a good time, than ever fighting anything or for anything. I think there's a lot of Christianity like that today. They'd rather go to social events, do this, do that. But God forbid they have to fight for their faith today that we ought to hold dear and be willing, if need be, to die for it. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. Somebody said it's more, more concerned for the wealth, for their own, excuse me, own welfare than spiritual warfare. A lot of truth in that statement as well. Spiritual warfare, to really stand for the faith, will divide eventually in this nation the wimps from the men of God. It really will. And uh, I think that it's coming sooner than later and uh, coming rapidly. Paul seems in this introduction that he gives us in the verses we read to you tonight to be a man who is in command, like a general of a military. And when he gives the word of God out that we read from tonight, it is as though he's trying to encourage the troops to rally them together. That's why we have uh, the military songs that are played. I know J.R. used to have a guy stand up and, and, uh, or marching with the flags, and they would do the Marine Corps, they would do the Navy, they would do the Army. Each of them have their own songs, but those songs are there to build morale and to encourage them when they hear them. From the halls of Montezuma. I mean, it just sort of, it almost boosts your spirit when you even sing it, even if you're not a Marine or whatever. And uh, that's exactly what Paul is trying to strive to do with the church of Colossae. Ann told me that her and, Anne, uh, her and Harold uh, a few months ago went through the book of Colossians. She wanted to know what I was preaching tonight. And, uh, and I told her, she said, oh, that's a great book. I said, it is. I'd never preached through it. I'd studied it before, but I'd never preached through it in any church I've ever been in. And uh, she said, man, Harold and I really enjoyed that. And then she told me what they learned. And then I said, well, this is the reason for the book, and this is the reason uh, why he also has to combat some things within the church, as many pastors sometimes have to do. But he's trying to teach the troops and rally them together to stay on the firing line. He's trying to get them to continue to fight the good fight of faith. And boy, how we need to do that. Would you not agree? And more today we need to stand for what is right. Well, how does he do it? Well, in the course of this week and next week, there are three vital truths that he gives to us about soldiers and about what, if we're going to be a good soldier, what we need to know and what we need to be involved in. All right? First thing he shares with us in verse, the first verse we read from tonight, he mentions it. The ministry or the service that we ought to desire as saints. I don't know about you, but we ought to desire a ministry. Amen? When, what, when we talk about ministry, now I know today the ministry has so radically changed in so many places and by so many churches and even by colleges. The word minister, anybody know what the word means? What does it mean? It means to serve. It means to be a servant to somebody else. Doesn't mean to be served, but to serve others. And uh, so we ought to want to serve who? Him. We ought to find something to do for him, somewhere to serve him, uh, to be a servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many times will you find in Paul's introduction to many of his epistles, the first couple verses that he gives them? is to remind them that we're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're his servants. Bond slaves is the actual word in the Greek, which means we are free indeed, but we choose to live under his authority by choice. 
Does that make sense? A bond servant was someone that had earned their freedom. But due to their love for their master, they chose to continue in slavery. Isn't that a beautiful truth? And that's how we ought to feel towards Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our master. He did everything for us. The least we ought to do for him is to say, I want to be your bond slave. I want to serve you to the day I die. We need those kind of Christians in our churches today, desperately. Stuart Brock Briscoe, I have a couple of his books, make this statement. You cannot be reconciled to God without first being recruited for God. Last week we just dealt with reconciliation. Remember those last few verses? Uh, it means to mend, to repair a broken relationship. We were broken by sin and becoming sinners by choice and by conception. And yet Jesus came to restore our relationship with the Father. And that's what's called born again, being saved. And we're born into the family of God. But the moment you got uh, reconciled to God, I didn't know this when I got saved. You also did something else. You enlisted in his military. <laughs> You became a good soldier of Jesus Christ, or supposed to be. I'll say you're supposed to be a soldier. He wants us to be good soldiers. Maybe there are many soldiers, but maybe not so many good soldiers that may be out there. And we ought to be a, a, want to have a desire, a hunger, to literally become a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the way to do that is to decide, I'm going to serve God. Everybody can find something to do. Everybody's got a place. I thought today, as I was thinking of serving, and people in my churches, and I could, of course, went over there and say, you, all right, not hit, I mean, uh, uh, Brian back here, <laughs> uh, back here. He serves. How does he serve? He knows something about PA equipment, how to deal with microphones and everything, and uh, that's his place of service. Are you with me? His mother. And I know she doesn't want any recognition. She doesn't want it at all. Well, I'm going to give her just a tad bit anyway. But she loves serving how? Uh, the beautiful decoration she puts up. Doesn't she do a great job? Amen. Man, is she talented Amen. in that. Denise is serving. And taking on another responsibility. Does our bulletin. Doesn't ask for anything. Uh, now she is now our bookkeeper. She serves. Judy, you're a servant. You have a gift of ministry. Do music and song. It takes practice, rehearsal. Whether you're singing solo or singing with a group. My wife, I know for a fact has a, a unique ability. I, one, of the, one, one of the gifts I know my wife has is the gift of encouragement, exhorting. She's all the time. She doesn't, she doesn't spend a week without exhorting somebody by texting, sending messages. She sent her messages because they were so low uh, over the last several weeks. I mean, he's been sick and real sick for the last four weeks. He hasn't eaten anything in almost four weeks. But in the last two days, he's finally putting some food down. And keeping it down. But uh, she loves to encourage people. It's one of her gifts. I really believe that. All right? Uh, Jill. I'd have to say Jill is ministry, which is one of the gifts of the Spirit, by the way. And the word ministry means being a servant to others. Doing as unto others. Tom. Um, <laughs> I forget Tom. <laughs> I'm only kidding, Tom. No. <laughs> No, he has a giving up all the time. Hey, you need anything, preacher? Can I do anything for you? Uh, he helped me split wood this year, and I appreciate that very, very much. All the time coming to me wanting to do something. But uh, I tell you what, uh, there's all kinds of people that make up the church. Amen? Uh, you know, Tom said, if there's anything you need, I've been asking for a million dollars for years, and I still haven't seen So he's not a very good helper, to be honest with you. Very... <laughs> but anyway, uh, but. So, if we're going to serve the Lord, how are we going to serve him? Well, first thing Paul suggests, if we're going to minister, he's talking about himself. Keep in mind, he mentioned, who am a minister? He was talking to, about himself to the church of Colossae. He said, hey, what I'm getting ready to preach to you, I put in shoe leather myself. I have served the Lord in the ways I'm telling you, you need to be faithful in serving the Lord. First thing he says about serving the Lord is the continuing of serving the Lord. Steadfastness. Uh, continuing, not quitting, not throwing in the towel, keeping on, keeping on. 
Notice what he says and how he says it in verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded, I like that word, and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye heard, now he's going to say it, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a servant or a minister. See, Paul loved serving people. He gave his life up because he served people. And, uh, but he continued. He was faithful. Even before his death, which was beheading, by the way, uh, by Rome, he literally said that his desire and greatest desire was to finish his course, his race that God had started out giving him on the road to Damascus. Did he finish well? Oh, yeah. He finished wonderfully well. I hate to be called up to the judgment beam of seat of Jesus Christ right after Paul. <laughs> I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to follow his act whatsoever. But anyhow, so he says we need to continue. Continue how? Well, number one, he says we're, we're to continue ministering or serving. Continue in our service to the Lord. Uh, the word continue means to persevere, to keep on keeping on. Just this past weekend, a pastor uh, contacted me, and I dropped him another text. And the closure of my text to him was, Brother, sometimes it's hard to do it, but I want to exhort you to keep on keeping on got to do it. When you don't feel like it, keep on keeping on. When you're sick, keep on keeping on. When you're in pain, keep on keeping on. When you feel like you're half dead, keep on keeping on. It's just important for us to keep on keeping on. One of the great secrets, if you've ever studied the book of Acts, and I've preached the book of Acts a couple times, but the book of Acts is a great book. But when you look at the early church, there is no shock and no surpriser. Why it says of the early church of a few thousand believers, 3,000 to start off with, literally filled Jerusalem with God's doctrine. Another statement made by God, they, they, these who have turned the world upside down for God. You're looking at just a, a thousands of people, not millions, when these statements are made. What was one of the secrets? I think the power of God, but one thing, of course. They were serious about their faith. They were serious about sharing their faith. Like the grandmother and I are talking today about T.J. He has such a passion for souls and a passion to, to preach and a passion to uh, win people to Jesus Christ. He just doesn't really know completely everything he needs to know. I, or he could know better to be able to put it in shoe leather better than he does. Does that make sense? But he's going. He's trying, man. He really is. But uh, when you think about the book of Acts, the power of God, sure. The seriousness that they considered themselves as Christians following the faith, following the Lord Jesus, willing to die for their faith. What was the secret? Read it throughout the book of Acts, and you will see these, this little phrase tucked away. And they continued. Over and over again, it's there. <laughs> Why? Because I think God is reminding you and I, we're to continue if there's suffering. We're to continue in the midst of persecution. We're to continue even if someone threatens to kill us. If they threaten imprisonment, keep on keeping on. Did Paul not do the same? He did. He practiced his preaching. And he did it well, by the way. The word grounded is a word Paul uses. Uh, when we think of being grounded, we think of having a foundation built under such things as new converts, okay? That's what we do with TJ uh, at the present. Uh, trying to build a firmer foundation for them to stand on. So that when the onslaughts of the devil, sin, the world, all the things that are out there bent on destroying us and causing us to throw in the towel doesn't happen because he's more grounded and settled in his faith. Make sense? But that's not what this word in this Greek text stands for. I just wanted to say that about when we think of grounded. That's what we usually think of. But the word here means being settled, being established. One who is consistent and never changes. I like that. I love that. 
when we were, and I hadn't seen Brent for, man, since he was over at Crossroads and we took him on when he was going to Europe as a missionary, Brent down in Alabama. And I almost called him to death. I think I called him tomorrow. We found that something tragic, not about him, but about his mom today. But uh, anyhow, uh, I hadn't seen him for years, a lot of years. I don't even know how many years ago he was with us over there. That's the last time I saw him, to be honest with you. Saw him before that when I went down to help ordain him to the gospel ministry. But when Brent introduced me on Sunday morning, I liked what he said. He didn't brag about my preaching. Ain't nothing to brag about. He didn't surely brag about my looks. But I tell you what he bragged about, in my opinion, what I like he bragged about. You know how he introduced me? He said, I introduced my pastor who I have not seen for years and this and this and said complimentary things. But then he said these words. He said, the reason he stands behind my pulpit today is because he's a man that has never changed. And I have. I told him, I said, there's only one thing I don't believe as strongly about as when I was your pastor, Brent. I told him this at lunch, at lunch day, and I told him what it was. He said, I'll have a qualm with that. Now, doctrinally, I believe everything I believe and preach back there. This is not, this is a practicality. But anyway, I'm simply saying, hey, we ought not to change. This book doesn't change. God is changeless. Is he not? Closes the Old Testament with that very last thought. God who changes not. And so we, we have so much change sometimes today that is not good. I like John MacArthur. He, I'm not agreeing with him on everything in church leadership with John MacArthur, but I have several of his commentaries and books. But John MacArthur put it well when he said this, Perseverance is the hallmark of of a true saint of God. All right? What did he say? He said there ought to be consistency. There ought to be faithfulness. There ought to be... the Christ, Christians don't need to be like this. Constantly vacillate. Oh, I'm hot today, cold the next, hot now, today. There ought to be an even keel. Or really, the Christian life ought to go like this. But there ought to be nothing like that. <laughs> but sometimes there are big dips like that for some Christians, isn't it? Get away from God. Backslide. Come back to God. Get on fire for God again. And and so forth. And uh, the world sees that as a wishy-washy religion, a wishy-washy Christianity. We need to be keep on serving, keep on standing, keep on striving, keep on keeping on. How long? To death either comes or Jesus comes. Okay? There's no retirement in the Christian life. But, one of my favorite things of all that I've ever done and never learned to do is to read biographies of great Christians. I know you've come to me more than one time and asked me, put some of my books on my shelves. I, I may have lived you a few of them. I don't know. I can't remember if I did. Greater spiritual experiences. No, spiritual experiences of great Christians, I think, is the one you've got, right? That I recommend it to you to read. Little mini biographical sketches of many great Christians in that book. And it's great reading. You'll learn a lot. But what I've done it for is, and what I, I got addicted to it when I was in Bible college, because it made me have a year of it, where you learn all these famous Christians, biographies, and so forth, where they grew up, what God did through their life. The thing that I always studied them for was two things. I wanted to know about their walk with God, and then how they became successful, where they were, as they were. But I cannot honestly say, every single great Christian, almost of every biography I've ever read, Gene, I think, would agree with at least that book. And you've read that book, right? Would agree with this one thing. Almost every single one of them, I don't care who they were, they were a pastor, evangelist, a missionary, uh, a hymn composer, such as Isaac that we talked about earlier, and others like him, almost without failure, every single one of them that did anything for God suffered much for their faith. Isn't that right, James? James and Sandra on every Sunday morning sits right there. And uh, back months ago, I made a mention of something in a sermon here. And uh, the very next week, I got a magazine in the mail. I'll give it take a week or two later. And I said, 
I asked my wife, I said, did you subscribe to this? And she said, no. Well, I don't know why. And it showed that I had a subscription for it. And it was came, came to James without me knowing that I came in and asked someone. And uh, he said, yeah, I, I subscribed that magazine for you because I thought you'd be interested in it. And it is a great magazine. It's uh, Martyr. Uh, what's the crazy thing called? Voice Martyrs voice, for the Faith? Voice of the Martyrs. Voice of Martyrs. Yeah, the Voice of Martyrs magazine. And it's showing you not past, even though they have some of those in there, not just dealing with past persecution, past deaths, past martyrs, but everyday martyrdom that takes place somewhere in the world literally every day by sometimes the thousands. The horror stories of answering a door and the enemies at your door and they throw acid in your father's face and it eats the flesh right off his skull when he opens the door. That's Islam. Okay, and in the Sudan, in Africa, in India, if you're not Hindu and a follower of Hinduism and a Christian, you can suffer even still in India. Certainly China and other parts all around the globe, it's happening. And sometimes we fail because we have our comfortableness here. That we fail to remember some of our brothers and sisters around the globe are in deep pain and sorrow and deep suffering. So, we need to understand, though many have gone through great trials, and a soldier goes through trials, and what Paul is saying to these soldiers that he's trying to encourage within the church of Colossae, I want you to keep on keeping on. They're going to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at you. But don't let it de deter you from the calling, from the place you're serving, and the place that you're standing. For anything. Just keep on keeping on. Just endure for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's all kinds of stories. I have a, a site that I tune in and look at occasionally. Give you a couple stories off of those. Talk about suffering. Talk about difficulty. Talk about amazing comebacks. And not all of these are Christians, by the way, of any that I'm giving you today or tonight. But they're interesting to prove a point. That when we don't quit. God's going to bless us, and God's going to do some sometimes pretty amazing things with us, despite who we are. John Fulton was run over when he was three years old as a little boy, run completely over, so much to so. I read what he ended up having done and having in the hospital when he arrived. Both sides of his ribs were broken, crushed both hips, fractured his skull. Compound fractions on both legs broken multi-times. Should have died. Was put on life support system. And the doctors literally told his mom and dad he will not make it. But guess what? That little three-year-old boy had some uh, true grit in his soul. He didn't throw in the towel. He didn't, throw in the, he didn't say, I think I'll just quit. But through the help of mom and dad, and himself and his perseverant spirit as a child now. That young man grew up and ran a one-half mile race with those broken legs that they never thought would run or do anything else, all right? And he literally, in his time, did it under two minutes' time, which is pretty fast, by the way, okay? Uh, I'm just simply saying, hey, he didn't quit. He didn't throw in the towel. You have on your screen a man, and you have it, the little biography, Biographical and sketch there. Walt Davis, totally paralyzed when he was nine years old by polio. Said he'd never walk again, but he didn't quit, and he became an Olympic champion for the United States in 1952. Interesting, isn't it? Why? Because they wouldn't throw on the tap. Why? Because they continued and continued. They said, hey, just because a doctor says so, don't make it so. Amen. And uh, that's still true today, trust me. Shelly Mann, paralyzed, polio, at five years of age, but she didn't quit. She ended up breaking eight swimming Olympic records and won the U.S. gold medal in Melbourne, Australia in 1956. These are, I can pull these up all day online. That just amazes me. What tenacity, what kind of true grit some of these persons... They, I'm not saying they're saved people, 
These are just common people. But they have what we ought to have, especially with the Spirit of God in us, a desire so serve God no matter what comes, no matter what we face, no matter what we may be called by God to endure. Keep on keeping on. Everybody knows this one, don't you? The correct? It was so clumsy, you may not know this, so clumsy that the boys in his neighborhood would never invite him to play on their team. You remember those days we used to meet on, uh, we, we played baseball in this great big, in fact, it still exists. I've been there since I've been a kid. It's across from Story Store, Night Shop Road, Madison Heights. Great big old field, completely surrounded by a, a barbed wire fence, which became our fence to play. That was the boundaries. Home run, as long as it was good and it went within the confines of the back field fence, it was a home run in the pines. Didn't see a whole lot of them, but we had a few. But, uh, man, all the guys that went to Amherst County High School and eventually even before that great school at Madison Elementary, we'd meet there on High Shop Road and play ball. I'm talking about sometimes the teams would have as many as seven guys a player. Seven guys a team, that's a pretty good number, about 14 guys. And, uh, man, we played, and we played all summer long. We didn't watch TV. We outdoor kind of guys. And just played baseball, played baseball, played baseball. But, man, we always, when we played baseball, always, all right, who's going to be the captain? And sometimes we'd be rock, scissors, or we'd flip a coin and whatever. And different captains of different days, different times, different people. I was a captain a few times. Others were captains at the time. Mike Stone was a captain at times. But anyway. Just simply saying, when you became a captain, your job was to line them all up. Two captains standing out, here's how we did it. And the other 14 players or 12 players or 10 players would be standing out in line. And then whoever won the flip of the coin got to take the first pick. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you pick with your first two or three picks? You try to get the what? The best player. Who's always chosen last? The one that you know may not be the best catcher may not be the best fielder, may not be the best batter. And they're always some of those kids, <laughs> always has been. So I'm just simply saying, that's exactly how it was for Lou Gray. Think about that. But did he quit? Did he say, you know what, I don't think I'm going to bat again. I, I'm trying to teach my grand boys down in Texas that very principle. Because they're not the best baseball players at the present. And I throw with them, hit with them, I teach them how to bat and some things that I think I do know. And uh, they just keep sometimes struggling. But, man, last two games, Grayson, he didn't get a hit. Of, I mean, he never even hit the ball. He either struck out or walked every time this last season in the fall of the ball game. But the last two games, I didn't get to see it. They played two games after we left. He got to hit the ball both times, and he called me both nights. And he did, Paul, Paul, guess what I did? And I thought, man, maybe a home run. I was hungry. He said, I got to hit the ball. I said, who'd you hit it to? Oh, I hit second base. One of them I got on. <laughs> because he heard the ball. But anyhow, I'm just simply saying, hey, uh, don't quit. Don't throw in the town. As someone well said, and I preached many years ago, it's always too soon. And that's what Paul is hitting. By the way, when you read most of his church epistles, he has that in almost every one of them to the Christians of the faith in each church. Don't quit. Not saying it that way. In this verse, he said, you need to learn to continue. Continue serving. Continue standing. Continue striving. Continue being faithful to your faith that you ought to be grounded and settled in greater the grounding, I think the greater the steadfastness of one's life. Woodrow Wilson, how many know who he is? All you got to do is go over to Stan, don't you? No account Democrat. <laughs> I don't care what he was. He didn't quit. I do like that. But uh, he, uh, when he was 10 years old, I don't know if you've ever read this over there or not, he didn't learn to read until he was 10 years old. Yet he became our 28th president of the United States of America. Think about that. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? That's what you call a real slow learner or slow reader, right? And yet he did not go into town. He did not quit. Not quitting has nothing to do with doctrine. But it has everything to do with our duty. I have a duty to my commander-in-chief. Amen? So do 
you. And our job each day when we rise in the morning is report to headquarters, to him, our commander-in-chief, and let him guide, direct, and instruct us through this, through prayer, and get his direction for our life each and every day. If you're going to be a good soldier, a good soldier doesn't decide, hey, you join the military, I don't care what branch it is. Now, I, I didn't have to go, so I haven't been in there, so I don't, I'm not speaking, except out of experience of talking to other military men <coughs> who did experience boot camp and other such things. No soldier ever is going to be a good soldier, right, John? Regardless, Navy, Army, Marine, Air Force. Bill would tell us stories every Saturday of his military career and, and the, the Air Force. But I have learned one thing about all of them, and that is this. You don't decide where you're going, when you're going, when you're in the military. You don't determine, well, I think I'll go get something to eat now. No, you won't either. You don't determine, I think I'll rise at such and such an hour. No, you won't either. You have no say in the fact of what you do, where you go, as long as you're on duty. You have one duty and only one obligation and only one responsibility to obey your command. Sure. Whoever he is, whatever rank he has. Amen? We have only one responsibility, folks. One duty as the children of God, as a soldier of Jesus Christ, is to seek to always please, honor, and obey him. Amen? I'll tell you what, if we do that, uh, we will do well. And we will all finish well and finish better. All right. Ten minutes till. Let me give you, oh man, there's a, oh, by the way, not, not a bad pressure. Let me give you a one real quick. I did see it for you. I know you didn't write this down. I'm surprised you did. Before I saw